Hey there, my name is Josh, this is Understanding the Bible, and on this channel, I wanna help you understand the Bible to see what it says, what it means, most importantly, to give you tools to grow in your understanding of God's Word. So today we're gonna to be doing that by answering a question that a lot of you have, and that is, what is the most accurate Bible translation? And so I'm just gonna let it out from the front. Here is my hot take, here's my spicy take, and I'm gonna back it up, I'm gonna walk it through. But I believe all major Bible translations are of equal accuracy, near equal accuracy, except for one, NASB, ESV, NKJV, um, what else, uh, CSV, um, NIV, NLT, NRSV. Um, if you read any of these translations, I think they're highly accurate. Now, they have different methodologies, and they may be useful in different situations. So I'm not saying they're all going to be as equally accurate to you. So some may be more accurate for your English language than another, and some may be more useful for the purpose than another, but they're equally accurate. And a lot of times when people talk about accuracy, they talk about translation methodology, and they focus on this key idea of word for word versus um, thought for thought. So it goes something like this. In the word for word idea, you have translations that try to stick as close to the original Greek and Hebrew manuscript, as close to the Greek and Hebrew words as possible. So they're translating as much as they can at a word level to make sure that the word used in the Old Testament matches how it's used in English as closely as possible. So they're going to keep a lot of the grammar. They're going to try to keep that as tight as they can. And um, sometimes this can be a little hard to read. So examples of this um, are the New American Standard Bible, um, NASB and ESV. These are really good examples. Um, I find that of the two, the ESV is a bit easier to read, but both of them have this methodology, and a lot of people who are looking for accurate translation, they'll point to one of these two. They'll say, I use the ESV because it's more accurate. And sometimes people will look at the other extreme, the classic example being the New International Version, the NIV, and think it's less accurate because its approach is more um, thought for thought. It, that sometimes it uses a word like dynamic equivalence or something. It's where you take a whole idea from the original language and you translate that idea rather than each individual word into the new language. So in our case, probably into English. That process is gonna keep less of the original structure. The translation level is gonna be a bit more at a macro than micro level, right? Looking at sentences and paragraphs instead of words. And so, so the debate is, isn't that a more interpretive process? See, the ESV, you know, the first one, word for word, they're just giving you the translation. They're not telling you what it means. But over here with the NIV, they're giving you the interpretation of what it means. They're interpreting for you instead of translating. And that misunderstands the, what the idea of accuracy and how translation works. Because the reality is all translation methods are going to be looking at words and their context in order to translate them. So neither method is ignoring words or context. You have to have those. You can't translate without them. This happens to me all the time. Sometimes my wife who's from Korea, she'll ask me, what does such and such word mean? And I'll be like, I, tell me tell me a sentence. I mean, it could mean a lot of things. You know, I can't tell you what it means until you tell me. Or I mean, I could list her like multiple definitions, but it doesn't work, right? She's asking, what does this word mean in a specific sentence? And I can't answer or translate that word for her unless I know the whole sentence. So the word for word people do this, and so do the thought for thought people. They can't translate thoughts without looking at words. So let's take a simple example of ordinary translation. And before we do this, let's see what is the goal. The goal is that you hear something in a language you don't speak. So if you speak Korean, you can translate along with me. Yeah, let me know in the comments if I'm doing it right. And that in the language you speak, you understand the original meaning. And we're gonna have a test for this one because there's a question. 
If you can answer the question accurately, then you understood the accurate meaning of the question. Seems like a logical way to test this, right? So I'll say a um, question in Korean, and then I'm going to translate it for you. You'll answer in the comments the answer to the question, and then we'll see if you correctly answered what I was trying to ask. If not, you misunderstood the sentence, so it wasn't an accurate translation. And we're going to do this word for word. So here is the question. I'm going to try to put it right here. Pop magoso yo. Sorry if you speak Korean and that was a bad pronunciation, but pop magoso yo. We're going to translate it now. So the first word is pop. This means rice. Kind kind of means rice. I don't, this is actually tough to translate. So. In Korean, there's more than one word for rice. So there's, um, they have actually multiple words, and they all like they all have different specific meanings. So this is one of the words for rice, but how should I translate it? Like, I could try to say what type of rice it is, right? Like ordinary rice, generic rice, something like that. I don't know, um, unspecified rice, but uh, that doesn't feel that good. How about I'm, all right, I'm making a translation decision right now. I'm just gonna call it rice. So between you and me. If I were doing this, I could do it in a footnote. There's other types of rice, and it doesn't mean that, but this does mean rice. So I'm going to say rice. Mogo means eat. Um, it's just the verb eat, and mogo so means past tense of eat. So um, eight. Rice, eight. So pop mogo so yo. And then yo, mm, this is worse than rice. This is worse than pop because. We don't have this word in English. There, there is no word for this in English. Um, so, one option I could just not. I could put it in Korean, so I could say rice ate yo, but that's weird. Um, what about? All right. So let let me just explain to you. I can't do this in the translation. It's too long. But I'll tell you right now. Um, in Korean, they have three general levels of politeness. So there's the uh, most formal, and uh, we don't have this word in English, so I can't really say what it is, but they, the, the most formal language, and you would use this, like, let's say you're meeting a boss, or you're just trying to be really formal, or you're on stage or something, you know, like a time where you just need to speak formal. Um, and sometimes you just say this in normal language for no reason, but, you know, that's hard to explain, but most formal language. So, for example, if you were to say, like, kamsamnida, thank you, like, that's the formal one. But then there's, the, like, the normal way, and this is the yo kind of way, and that's what's going on here. This is intermediate formalness, intermediate politeness. And it is uh, like, you would use this pretty much all the time. This is the most normal way to speak Korean. So if you're learning Korean, just learn this one. It's the most useful. Um, and you would definitely use this if you were talking to somebody older than you. Um, you would definitely use this like in a, um, like as long as it's not like the, like the main boss, you know, you know, you're not trying to be super formal. Um, you would use this for any kind of supervisor. Um, and you might use this for children and stuff too. You don't have to, but it's like polite. You want to teach them how to be polite. Um, so that's this one. And then there's the, the lowest level. And this is kind of how uh, maybe friends could talk to each other if they're being friendly or how, you know, like, you know, adults could talk to kids or, um, you know, let's say an older adult could talk to a younger kid. A supervisor could talk to the person they're supervising. Uh, you don't have to talk like this, but you could. And you might call it the like friendly way or something. I don't know. So it's a informal. I don't know. So pop go so yo. This is the middle. So we could say something like middle mid formality, uh, medium formality, or politely. I'm just gonna call it sir. Like let's say it's talking to a man. Obviously, we could say sir or ma'am. Um, so rice ate sir. All right. So answer the question in the comments. Rice ate, sir? Give you a minute. Let us know if you rice ate, sir. But if you're having a hard time answering this, it's because it doesn't make any sense, right? Uh, this word for word translation, one, was extremely interpretive. Two out of the three words in here, I didn't know how to translate, and I had to go through this process of saying, like, well, how do you say this in English? This, this doesn't even exist in English, right? And this is what's happening in biblical translation. It doesn't matter if you're doing word for word or thought for thought. When you read sentences, sometimes there's a one-to-one -one correspondence, like the word uh, mogoso. That, it just means eight. That 
English, Korean is the same, right? Same thing with Greek and Hebrew. There's lots of words that match between the two. But there's other words that either don't match perfectly or don't match at all. They're words that don't exist in our language. Um, there's words where maybe there's one Greek word, but there's three different English words that mean a similar thing. And you have to pick which one to do. Or there's um, a Greek or Hebrew word, and we have no words for it, right? So how do you translate it? And that was the problem in this sentence. That was one of the problems. So it doesn't make sense. Rice ate, sir? Like, what am I even asking? So let's try to smooth this out into a sentence that actually makes sense in English. So I'm going to add the two, two words to it. Did and you. Because that's how we talk in English. So in Korean, they don't usually use pronouns. They just kind of ignore them and then you just assume them. So if this is Sunny talking to her dad, we know that this is like second person. She's asking him. So we're going to add the pronoun you. And then also for grammar, we're going to add did. So did you eat rice, sir? Now this is a sentence that makes sense. It's just kind of different from the first one, right? So rice ate, sir. Now we change it to did you eat rice, sir? So I've swapped the grammar. I could have said, did you rice eat, sir? Kind of Yoda style, but it doesn't make sense. So I've changed it to, did you eat rice, sir? Now, this is more understandable, right? It's more accurate to what's being said. I had to supply two words that weren't there, but now you can actually understand the sentence. So we've got this, did you eat rice, sir? Let us know, did you eat rice, sir? But you might be wondering, what, what do I mean by that? So I, I hope you've written your answer, or at least thought it. And uh, did I mean, have you eaten rice today? Like, am I asking you, like, have you just eaten rice? Or am I asking you, um, did you eat rice ever, right? So if you ate rice a year ago, how should you answer, did you eat rice, sir? Yes or no? It's a bit hard. You might need to ask for clarification, right? You could say, yes, I've had rice. I loved it. Um, or you could say, not today, right? But what is the answer to, did you eat rice, sir? So if, you've, if you haven't eaten rice today, but what if you had, what if you just ate a hamburger, right? The question to, did you eat rice, sir, is probably, no, I had a hamburger. What if you had, what if you had a bag of potato chips and a Coke? And so, it's, it's pretty easy to answer in English whether or not you've eaten rice. But, but here's the thing, in Korean, the question isn't asking any of that. And so if I were to translate the sentence accurately so that you can really understand what it means, I would translate, have you had a meal? Have you eaten yet, right? If it was lunchtime, I could say, have you had lunch yet? Or did you eat lunch? Uh, none of these are word for word, but they would allow you to answer the question well. So if it's lunchtime and you have had lunch, it doesn't matter what it was. If it was um, a hamburger, you would say, yes. Pop mogoso, I've had lunch. Um, if you had had a bag of potato chips and a Coke, you would say, no, right? Even if you would have had like a little rice ball and somebody says, have you, you know, have you eaten rice? You would say, no, you know, cause it's lunchtime and you haven't had lunch. Because the question, yo is asking you if you've eaten a meal. It's a common expression in Korean that we don't have in English, and accurate translation is going to require translating it so that you can understand. So here's the great news. All of the major translators are doing this no matter what method they use. Word for word, thought for thought, they're all looking at the meaning of the sentences. And they may have different methodologies for how they convey that. Sometimes they understand that you'll know an expression. So when Jesus says, give us this day our daily bread, they have to ask themselves, if we translate this as bread, are people going to understand this expression to mean just like only about bread? If you are on a low carb diet, you're going to be like, whoa, I can't pray this. Um, no, they understand that you are able to discern because bread is part of, you know, the regular English language, that we can understand that to mean, you know, our meal, our sustenance. It's used as a bit of an expression, but it's one that they interpret that you're going to understand. However, have you eaten rice? 
is not going to work. You're going to misunderstand it to be about actual rice. And so that's going to require a different form of translation. So on the thought for thought, they're simply going to translate it, um, you know, in a way that makes more sense. Have you eaten yet? But on the word for word, they may use um, a footnote. They may, you know, use a different way. They may put it in italics. Uh, there may be a different method to convey that information. But all translations are going to be sharing that information based on their reader's language. And so don't worry too much about the accuracy. All of them are getting it accurate, and all of it involves interpretation. There's simply no way around it. You can't do word for word or thought for thought without interpreting how words are being used and how to put them in a new language. And so I think when you recognize that, when you start looking at how translation works in real life, this eases a lot of your burden because you realize the question is not which method are they using, right? That's a different question. You know, which Bible would be a good fit for me right now? Well, that's a different question to answer. The question to ask for accuracy is this. Do the translators speak the native language fluently? Do they speak my language? So not English in general, but my language, the way I speak, do they speak that language fluently? And are they skilled at translation? Because if they're not skilled at translation, it doesn't matter how good they are at understanding both languages, it's going to be off. And my take on all of the major translations that we read is that the teams of translators, they are very skilled and gifted at the original languages. So they're getting people who speak Greek and Hebrew well. They're also skilled at the English language. They're getting people who understand grammar and um, syntax and who can make sentences. And they, they all have a target audience in mind, right? They, they know who they're translating for and they, they translate well for that group. And then lastly, they're all skilled translators. And so I think in the major translations done by a team, they have this and they are accurate. Now there are some exceptions. And one is this, if you ever look at a translation that only has one author, you're gonna be looking at something that I think is less accurate. A team is more accurate than an individual. And that's because every group who translates is going to have to be making interpretations. There's no way around it. But a team of people has more resources to evaluate. They have more to bring to the table and they're gonna give you more accurate translations than individuals. So if there is a, um, somebody you like who's offered a translation, let's say you're a big fan of N.T. Wright and he does a translation, I'm telling you, N.T. Wright's translation he may be a great scholar, is probably going to be less accurate than the NIV. And the reason for this is because he doesn't have a team of scholars working together. He is going to have gaps in his knowledge that they don't. He's going to have gaps in his methodology that they don't. And so individual authors are going to offer less accurate translations as a general rule than teams. And that's why all of the major translations use teams. Secondly, there are some translations out there by individual authors who are not actually skilled. So um, the Passion Translation is a great example. If you own the Passion Translation, I would suggest it is so inaccurate that you might not want to keep it and you definitely don't want to use it as a standalone Bible. Uh, the problem is that the translator does not actually speak Greek and Hebrew well. Also, his translation method is um, it's poor, it's, it's dishonest. He claims that he's using sources which don't exist. So whenever a translator is using made up sources, right? when they say, I've gone to the Aramaic sources, but there are no Aramaic sources, you're looking at a bad translation that's gonna be inaccurate. I'm dropping a link in this to back this up. Um, check that out and watch all of Mike Winger's videos on the subject. Mike's done a lot of work to kind of expose the inaccuracy of this translation. And so check that out. Um, let me know if you're using the Passion Translation, what you think after you've seen his information. But here's the big one. Here's the big translation that misses one of the three. And this is not the Passion, which is bad. This is a normal, um, widely accepted translation. The King James Version is the least accurate 
normal translation of the Bible. Now, why am I saying this? Did the translators speak um, Greek and Hebrew well? I think they did. Did they speak your language well? No, they do not. They did not. They wrote this a long time ago. You do not speak Old English. You speak modern, current English. And the King James Version was not written in this language. And so whenever you read the King James Bible, you're going to be reading something that wasn't written in the language that you're reading. And so you're going to see words and you're going to think they mean one thing, but they don't. Those words had a different meaning back then. And you're going to read um, grammar that just doesn't translate to us. And so if you... If you read a lot of stuff from the 1500s and 1600s, then I'm not talking to you. You know, if you just read this all the time, this is your language, you're at home in this, you go to like um, medieval festivals and like speak naturally in this. If you have a PhD in Old English, whatever, like any of those cases, I'm not talking to you. But if you, if you speak normal American English, normal UK English, when you read the King James Version, it's not going to be in the language that you speak. It's going to be different. You're going to be able to understand a lot of it, but you're going to be, um, you're going to misunderstand a lot of it and think it's saying stuff that it's not. So does this mean you can't use King James? I'm definitely not saying that. I'm saying as a standalone Bible, it's not going to be accurate for you. So um, when could you use it? Use it whenever you can translate it into the actual English you use. It may be a beautiful way of saying things. It may be that for memory verses, it may be for you know putting a verse on a wall or decoration. Uh, King James is perfect. Just make sure you understand what those words mean. Um, it could be for daily reading. You love it. It inspires you. The, the poetry of it is just so beautiful. Make sure you read it alongside an English like a modern English translation. So if you want to read like the, the King James next to um, any of the modern translations, go ahead and do that. That would be the way to go. But whenever you read the King James on its own, if you don't speak this language, you're going to be reading something that is inaccurate because you don't capture the meaning of the words because you don't know the words you're reading. Um, and so that's my hot take. All the translations are equally accurate. I hope that's encouraging to you if you agree with it. Uh, if you don't agree with it, let me know why. Uh, and the King James is not accurate by itself unless you speak that type of English. So hope this is helpful. I hope this helps you find a Bible translation that you already have or that you're looking for a new one that it gives you some assurance about how accuracy works and helps you think it through in a different light. And um, if you're wondering which one is the most practical one for you, feel free to write a comment and I'll, I'll give you some advice or just go to the um, bookstore, go to a Bible store, go to BibleGateway.com, check out the translation, see how it works for you, see how you understand it and um, uh, just you know have fun with it. This is a great thing. It's nothing to be worried about, nothing to be stressed about accuracy. They're all accurate. They can all be helpful in some situations. So use the Bible that helps you read it and understand it and uh, hope you have fun and enjoy reading God's Word and understanding it from your accurate Bible translation.